today was that always you have the amplitude, remember not the intensity, you have to get that later by squaring, but the amplitude of the diffracted wave is always given by the Fourier transform of the aperture function. And we just did that in the simple one-dimensional case where there was a, uh, if you like, we were imagining a typical physics first example, an enormously long vertical slit that's effectively infinitely high, and it just gives uh, a plane wave hits it and then spreads out uh, behind the slit. And uh, we went through, and you've done this in the maths with Phil, uh, and uh, very important calculation. Basically, because we've got our plane wave arriving, and the slit is supposed to be, again, you know, perfectly sharp edges. So there's no amplitude to the scattering, and uh, <coughs> there's no amplitude here. And then suddenly we get illumination in this region, and we've just let this just be some um, arbitrary amplitude, and then no scattering again. So in 1D, all we had to do was take the Fourier transform of the slip function. And of course, we could take the Fourier transform of other functions in 1D. Um, you know, that we could, by being clever, arrange for the scattering to not be uniform il illumination of the slit, but uh, we're not going to consider inhomogeneous illumination at all. So, however, it's pretty obvious that real uh, apertures are two dimensional. And again, this is illustrated in figure 75. I've already put this up once. So basically, what we've really done is we've calculated this diffraction pattern. Notice that if the slit becomes, if you like, infinitesimally small, then basically it just acts as a source of secondary waves and energy reaches all parts of the geometric shadow. So if we've got an infinitesimal slit, basically, again, just you know, sketching, we, we've not done the Huygens-Fresnel principle uh, in, in detail, I'll mention that, what, you know, the basis of this. If the slit gets narrower and narrower, then basically it acts almost like a point source. The plane wave comes in and then you just get these secondary waves spreading out. And so you just get the aperture basically a acting like a point source, uh, you know, an infinitely long, thin point source, you know, a very physicist's idea. Uh, but what we've actually calculated in the last lecture would be this kind of pattern, a long slit but with finite width, where we basically uh, said, well, that's a, a you know, top hat function, this is black, then it's uniform illumination, then it's white, and this is what we get behind. We get this characteristic, and note again, this, this central maximum is much broader, and then we've got alternating dark bands and light bands, and we calculated that pattern uh, exactly, and uh, as I pointed out, it's just the limit. When we first considered figure 64, this was for n very uh, large, a very large number of closely spaced oscillators. You know, in other words, we, we calculated interference, many source interference, and then we saw when we got many oscillators and they get closer and closer together, we approximate exactly the single slit. So, of course, it's, it's no coincidence at all that the multi-source interference pattern that we have to slightly reinterpret the variable but is the same as single slit diffraction. So uh, we've got this broad central peak, remember here at pi halves that's part of the central peak here, then we have the first zero in the scattering and then the first maximum, side maximum at three pi halves and you can see obviously this function is basically linear and these are just the zeros in the sine function in the numerator of the sinc function. So what we've actually calculated in the last lecture was if you like this pattern and this pattern. Uh, in other words, and, and these are typical examples we've been taking where the, the aperture width 
is a few wavelengths, which gives us these characteristic patterns. But obviously a real aperture that was a slit would be rectangular, and we would also get amplitude in this direction, and this is the, the pattern. Again, the Fourier transform of any function is going to preserve the symmetry of the function, so clearly here with a rectangular function as the aperture function, when we Fourier transform it, we get uh, a kind of um, sy uh, rectangular symmetry in the scattering. And uh, you should be familiar with this from solid state physics. And you know, like you, you, if you look at the Bragg spots from uh, a crystal, they'll reflect the symmetry of the crystal. Um, but the most important of the um, problems is the circular aperture. Because obviously, if we make a telescope or we make a microscope, we don't have a rectangular aperture. We have a circular lens. And in particular, although I'm not going to do geometrical optics, diffraction places a limit on the angular resolution of any telescope or microscope. And that's what we're going to look at today. So, um, and, and some things, this is, these are actually Fresnel diffraction patterns that I'll come to, but one of the uh, in, interesting historical moments was that um, when, you know, light has had a, quite a history, you know, and you know, obviously people back to the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans have wondered what light is, and the science history was that in the 17th century, thanks to Huygens, it was a wave and people explain reflection and refraction, which we're coming to next week as a wave. In the 18th century, thanks to Newton's great work on optics, it was a particle. Uh, and his optics was published in 1704. But then after the Young's double slit experiment at the beginning of the 19th century, it went back to being a wave. Because how could you explain these interference patterns if it was just little bullets going through a hole? And there was a huge conference early in the 19th century with... There was only about a thousand scientists in the world at that time, you know, and so a lot of them got together on this new exciting wave theory of light. And Poisson, as in Poisson's equation, Poisson distribution, you know, he was a very clever guy, uh, just sort of sat there and scribbled down a quick back of the envelope calculation. You know, he, he said, well, this, this new theory is absurd because it could give rise, if I shine light through a circular hole, um, we could get uh, you know, a, a black spot in the middle and he sits down smugly like, you know, kind of, oh, I've you know, shown this new theory to be wrong. And the next speaker gets up and says, we were just coming up with our interesting observation of black in the middle of a, a circular aperture. And, you know, sort of like the experimentalists and the theoreticians, as usual, have a quick scrap and, you know, usual science conference. But anyway, um, the, uh, uh, ju again, just to recall because uh, it's very important to keep the approximations clear in your mind which way we're doing. We're still, in today's lecture, on this Fraunhofer diffraction. In other words, I've got plane waves arriving from a source at infinity, yeah, in, in uh, theory. I mean, we might actually arrange it with lenses, but in theory. And we've got the, the, the detector uh, off at infinity, so we can apply the plane wave approximation. And it's only in this case when the source and the detector are very different from the diffracting slit that we get Fraunhofer diffraction, and which we can describe by the, uh, the Fourier transform. So, um, again, this is slightly re-going over last lecture, but, you know, to be clear, in other words, we are in this limit here where we put our detector at P3, and emphatically, we will get different patterns if we're close to the source, and we'll have a look at that qualitatively on Friday but it is a little bit of a harder job. Now, again, one of my reasons for this sort of brief recap is that I didn't do the phasor diagram for the single slit diffraction. And um, this is part of ne next week, as you well, this week, uh, the coursework problem, I'm going to ask you to derive this from the Fourier transform, like we did last time. Uh, but I'm also, in the problem class, going to ask you to derive it from the phasor diagram. And actually, the phasor diagram, in this case, is really neat. Because instead of getting all of the uh, sources adding up um, in a discrete fashion, so we did this, um, again, the, the old disappearing view graph trick. It's in here somewhere. Um, we did this for the... Uh, individual sources. And you remember all our, our phasors, we started adding up 
and they were, of course, all of discrete lengths from discrete sources. Again, the logical place is, it, with, with single slit diffraction is to put the origin here, and this will be the edge of the slit at minus w halves. This will be the edge of the slit at plus w halves, if you like. And what you do, remember, it, it, the, the, the phasors are now infinitesimally small, and so now, rather than having to apply that polygon criterion, the phasors actually actually trace out the arc of a circle. So we keep the same rule, which is that we take the distance from the origin, which we take it here as the, the one edge of the slit, we go right the way across the slit, and we reach this resultant A by joining this point to this point. But this phase angle subtended here is pi w over lambda sine theta. That one should be ah, printed on your mind. This is precisely, remember, when we set the whole problem up, we had phi of y is equal to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the uh, 2 pi over lambda, there's my k, times the uh, y sine theta. So if y is equal to w halves, we get the phase at the edge of the slit, so this is the angle subtended here. And you can see that this is just this length here, this length here. Well, let's just do it in the half of the arc here. Obviously, the ratio of, of this half of this bit to this part of the circle is the same as the whole line to the whole segment. Well, this is just very obviously, the resultant is just in a right-angled triangle here with hypotenuse r and phase angle phi. So the amplitude is proportional to r sine theta, whereas this is now precisely the arc of a circle, but, you know, which by definition in radians is equal to r psi. This distance is the radius times psi. So if I divide the amplitude by this, am and, and again, we're always doing this, dividing out the amplitude uh, of the function um, at a phase angle of zero. Again, same thing, the R's cancel, and we're just left with sine psi over psi, which we abbreviate to sync psi. So it's always good. I mean, we proved that we got that answer from a Fourier transform, but it's very nice to see that it comes out very beautifully pictorially from the phasor diagrams as well. And all, all you're doing is basically taking the ratio of this distance here, which is R sine phi, to this arc, which is r phi, and you immediately drop out that the sync function describes the scattering. So it's a very, very uh, powerful uh, to do, be able to do things in two different ways. And for the prototype problem, uh, extremely useful. So now we come to, and again, with the blackboards in here, of my apologies, I'm just going to run through it with the view graphs. But anyway, don't worry too much. The idea of this lecture is to be a bit qualitative, uh, you're not going to be asked to do double Fourier transforms in an examination, but you do need to understand some of the features of the answer. So, first of all, the I mean, this is just a bold statement. It is the Fourier transform of the amplitude distribution across the aperture. And if you want to do two dimensions generally, and all apertures are 2D uh, generally, then the way that it's done... So, so you don't need to follow the details of this calculation, just the ideas, is to describe the aperture in terms of the P direction, where we've got the distant detector, is now described in terms of the direction cosines from the aperture. And it's kind of like, uh, what were those? And I remember last year somebody said, oh, we've never done direction cosines. So figure 33 of maths 1 Direction cosines. I bet you wondered when they'd come in useful, and this is their big moment. The direction cosines are simply these uh, distances, the cosine of alpha. In other words, they're the projections of a radius vector onto the x, y, and z axes. So, um, basically, that's what you do. It, oops, <laughs> a bit easier to read the right way up. Uh, for a general aperture in the xy plane, so I just get something that's a bit clearer here. For a general aperture in, in the xy plane, um, you have you describe this advance in phase uh, 
compared with the origin, and again, you choose the origin, of course, you know, in the middle of the slit to give the, um, which could be, remember, a circular, it could be rectangular, it, you know, it could be any old shape, it could be oval, you know, it could be a banana shaped slit. We're allowed to cut any hole we like in a, in, in a screen, but of course, being physicists, we don't worry about tricky ones, we just do rectangles and circles. So these are the direction cosines are L and uh, M. So um, we basically now get an advance in phase, which is 2 pi over lambda times LX plus MY. In other words, we've got, we've got to, we, of course, we've got to define two directions in space. If I, you know, in our um, simple example where we had a single slit, we just had scattering, you know, which was symmetrical coming out in this plane, whereas now we get a full... 2D pattern to consider, and of course we have to define it in terms of the directions uh, L and M, but that is, a, a, the maths just gets harder, but the, the principle is just the same as what we did last time. So now, the amplitude of the scattering is a Fourier transform, again, um, C prime, I'm just, just an arbitrary constant at the front here. This is just related to the, if you like, the brightness of the source. You can see that we've now got a function. That the ap that's the aperture function. Yeah, this is the function of position. This is, this is what describes whether it's a rectangle or a circle. And then our Fourier transform, which last time was e to the minus 2 pi i u over dy, because we had a, a, where u was equal to sine theta over lambda, now we've got a two-dimensional Fourier transform. In order to calculate the amplitude in terms of, we've done it in 1D, where this was an amplitude of a, func a, a single function of y going across the slit, well now we've got to do the Fourier a double Fourier transform. So what you get is a Fourier transform in 2D, and you use these, these variables. So you can, of course, you know, like do this for any function. Fourier transforms have been well known since the um, early 19th century, and um, the answers are quite well known for any shape. So again, you don't have to do it all from scratch, or you just look up the Fourier transform in a, a load of tables. And actually, of course, the interesting one to do is the circle, because that is precisely the aperture that we're going to have for a telescope or a microscope. You know, it's the, that is the important one, and that's why people focus on it. Well, of course, it's a mess in Cartesian coordinates, but you transform, again, back to our good old year one maths, transforming to the oh, our theta coordinates, it uh, gives you a much nicer diffraction uh, uh, amplitude in terms of doing the integral over r and theta. Again, here, a, you're integrate, of course, you're, if you've got a circular aperture, you integrate over theta from naught to 2 pi, because you're going around the circle, and you integrate over r from naught to a, where that's the centre, and a is the fixed radius of the aperture. Once, uh, I mean, again, for some people this is easy, perhaps the maths and physics, the theoretical students will, will take this on. Otherwise, you can just say, well, you know, some very clever people have already worked out the answer, and it's, um, it comes out analytically in terms of Bessel functions. So you don't really need to know Bessel functions, but certainly if you're an astronomer, you should get familiar with these Bessel functions, because this amplitude, as I'll, I'll show in a, a few minutes, is um, what determines the resolving power of a telescope. This is a circular aperture. And even though, like, if you've got light coming through any circular aperture, it may be very large compared with the wavelength, but there'll be some diffraction effects. So you don't get a perfect image where you can just say the star is exactly there. It actually gives weak rings of diffraction, and of course the bigger the mirror, the closer together the, the rings are, or, or the lens. I just want to say one or two general points here uh, about uh, coming across new functions. 
So there's absolutely nothing to be afraid of when you come across a new function. You, some of you may have come across Bessel functions, some not. I came across them as a graduate because they come up a lot in neutron scattering. Uh, and so you, you just get used to them. And no, it's, they're actually fairly similar to sine functions. Um, this is where I get out my tiny violin. In my day, it was all tougher. That now, you literally just sort of like on your computer, you know, you go on Wolfram Alpha or you go on Mathematica and you type in Bessel function and it pop, you know, you've got it as a function. I mean, you know, what, what we typically, because the function is circularly symmetric still, you've got a perfect symmetry in a circular aperture with respect to theta. All you need to do is plot it as a function of r, basically. You know, like, you, you know that your aperture is circular, and we know both experimentally and it's clear that the Fourier transform of a circle has circular symmetry, that we get either a dark... It does depend on, on, on conditions, the dark or a light central spot, and the pattern is going to be completely symmetric. Oops, with respect to theta, it's only uh, with respect to the distance from the centre that we're going to get a variation of intensity. And the Bessel function it just tells you precisely what that amplitude is as you go out from the centre. So, when I were a lad, we used, to, we used to have to look them all up in tables. And this particularly horrific book by Abramovitz and Stegen, you can see, has actually no less than three chapters on Bessel functions. That now is all pre-programmed into things like Mathematica and Alpha. So, you know, you, you don't even need to know the details. Of course, if you're interested in mathematical and theoretical physics, uh, you'll want to be able to calculate them themselves yourselves. Here is the, the Bessel function um, uh, just typed out, uh, printed out and uh, you can see for all of these functions there's a positive and then a negative and if you go further out in argument you go around positive and negative. As I say they're a little bit like so trigonometric functions, the Bessel functions and um, the particular one that we're interested in, because it comes up, it's just, you know, an accident. It just so happens that the Bessel... And you see, this is a bit like the sync function. The Bessel function in the numerator is sort of sine-like, you know, sinusoidal, it wiggles. And you can see uh, the same argument. If you think of that as Bessel function of psi over psi, it's similar. I mean, we'd be amazed if it came out to be completely different to 1D scattering, and it isn't. So, uh, basically, it's the Bessel function of first order, and you'll see that at some point, it's a little bit grainy, of course, at some point, the argument is such that the function goes from positive to negative. In other words, the function goes through zero, and that's precisely the first zero in this circular pattern, you know, the dark ring. And so, you know, this is a well-known function and um, the, in <coughs> the, the function itself is plotted in uh, the upper figure. This is, this is the Bessel function. This is the amplitude. Yeah? And you can see, just like with the kind of Loch Ness monster function in 1D, you've got a wide central lobe and then it goes through zero and then you've got these little weaker oscillations that die off. Remember, we've got a psi in the denominator which is increasing as we go out because as sine theta increases psi increases but you can see it's got these weak side lobes and zeros so it's very similar to the uh, sync function in one dimension of course if we want the actual intensity or irradiance of the light we've got to square this function and the but the square is also very similar to what we've seen before there's my intense central lobe but now note the first zero I'll make I, this is the point that's important so I'll actually make a board note on this I'll go go through uh, these things um, with one or two board notes you'll notice the first zero in 1d just occurs at lambda over d for in 3D, it occurs at 1.22 lambda over D. But these um, zeros have become more and more close to linear as you go out in Psi. 
They're not quite linear. It's not exactly a sine function. You know, it's a different mathematical function. So uh, its behaviour is slightly different to that. So I, I will make a note on that because uh, this is what um, need. You don't need to do this 2D Fourier transform, but you do need to know the answer because the circular aperture is, is an important one. So the diffraction pattern of a circular aperture. And this one was, uh, again, this slightly historical note. This was first derived, as I say, the Fourier transform was known from the early 19th century. And Airy was the Astronomer Royal in Britain. And uh, I got yet another fine mathematician. He derived this in 1835. Well, obviously, is of special importance to astronomers. You know, we, you know, I try and choose odd examples from different areas, you know, for different sort of specialists of students. But this is, if you're an AP student, this is, this is a really important uh, piece of information. Uh, and why is that so? Well, since it is the pattern produced in the focal plane. Of course, a real telescope, you know, as those of you who are doing Phil's, Phil's courses know, uh, you use lenses and mirrors. But this is, the, this is the pattern produced in the focal plane of an ideal telescope with a circular lens or mirror. Obviously now, when you try and construct huge telescopes in order to get very high-resolution images, like you know the Keck telescope in Hawaii, sort of 10-metre um, telescope, you use uh, mirrors because it's just much easier to make metal. I mean, if you try and make glass, a glass lens 10 metres across, basically it sags. Glass is actually, strictly speaking, uh, it's sort of more of a liquid at room temperature than... Um, it's just a liquid with very high viscosity, so it, it sags. So you, 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 know, you, you, you usually, use, usually use a mirror, but it would apply to, you know, like you probably actually look through a telescope with a circular lens at some point in your lives. It applies, it doesn't matter whether, all the, all the details of the telescope aren't important. In the end, the light you're collecting has to go through a circular aperture, and so... Um, the uh, diffraction through that aperture limits your resolution. So the diffraction pattern is circularly symmetrical, obviously, but it's worth stating explicitly. And uh, Aries pattern, it's called Aries pattern just after the person who discovered it, uh, <coughs> uh, is, is plotted both as amplitude and intensity uh, in figure 73. So this is where we've, we've got to here. So you would actually, you know, rigorously you would obtain this pattern you would obtain the upper pattern by doing uh, the double Fourier transform over R and theta uh, of, of, of the circular function, and this is the amplitude. You then square your amplitude and you get the intensity, which is, uh, again, we can't deal with it in terms of number of photons at each point, but that's effectively uh, what it comes down to. So again, that point that I just circled there, uh, the first zero... is at 1.22 lambda over d. This just, this just is a pure property of a Bessel function. You do the Fourier transform, and it goes through zero at 1.22 over d. So that's the fact. Uh, wh where d equals 2a, uh, <coughs> where with a, the radius of the aperture. <coughs> 
So this is a fact. Um, and again, I'll just make a comment. Form si this, this lecture theatre is like, you know, the lecture of performing simple harmonic motion between blackboards on the two sides. But I'll have to come, come across to this one to complete the note, I'm afraid. Let me just get rid of this first. This is, um, again, just description, really. Uh, the zeros are not equally spaced. So do zeros have an E in it here? I don't know. I'll, let's leave it. Zeros are not, you know what I mean. They're not equally spaced. It's not quite as simple as the single slit diffraction pattern, but they tend to... They're almost linearly spaced. They, they become all, the function becomes more sinusoidal as you go further out from the origin, if you see what I mean. They tend to a separation of lambda over d uh, for large values. Of well, I think W was that chosen as the variable uh, for like for all right for large. Yes, yeah, I think I've wrote, written it as W. Excuse me, in, in in the lecture notes as the as the as the conjugate variable in the Fourier transform. So um, that is what happens in um, the scattering. Now, likewise. Just as in, you know, we worked out the intensity of the, of the side lobes in the single slit diffraction. And that is a calculation you really should know how to do. Because it's basically with the, if, if you're comparing with just sine psi over psi, and you know that the first zero of this function is at, uh, is at where, where psi is equal to, to pi, and the first subsidiary maximum is where psi is equal to three halves, well, you're precisely choosing this to be the, uh, a maximum in the sine function, which is equal to one. And so you've got one over your three pi halves squared gives you relative to the... If you make this... Again, in all these problems, we, we make the intensity one and the amplitude one and the intensity one in the middle... Of course, you can very quickly, analytically, work out the intensity of the lobes. Integrating over the Bessel function is slightly more uh, complicated. So again, I'll just give it to you uh, as a pure fact, which is um, the intensity Again, if you like the maths side, you can work these things out yourself. But that would take us a bit far off the point. The intensity of the first subsidiary maximum is 1.75% of the intensity at the centre. So that's... Again, a pure property of the, the square of the, uh, of the Bessel function. So that is the... Uh, so in other words, because it's a well-tabulated function, we can find all its zeros easily, and we can find uh, the intensities of all these little side lobes. So that's the, 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 the circular aperture. And... Just again, you know, because the blackboards were so restricted here. This is what it says in the, uh, you know, the VLE lecture notes from this lecture. So this equation, remember the amplitude, is a function of the Fourier, uh, the Fourier conjugate of the radius and of the angle and obviously depends on the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the radius of the aperture. And um, the diffraction pattern is described there. And all I've done, I think these are the crucial board notes from this part of the lecture, is basically take these notes about where the first zero is, about the zeros not being equally spaced. Now, the reason it's particularly important is imagine that you're pointing your telescope at 
a star, or you think it's a star, it might be two stars. Yeah? They're very close together in the sky, and you've now got each of them produces its own diffraction pattern in your telescope. You're looking, and you're not sure whether uh, you're looking at one star or two stars. And in, if you're looking at one star, uh, you, well, let's just say this is the diffraction pattern A here from a star. So you make a, it makes its own, and remember these lumps are very weak. This is only about 1.75% of this, of this height here. But you will, you know, each star will make its own diffraction pattern in the, in, in the focal plane of your telescope. Now, if your second star is right out here in angle, you're lo you know, looking through the telescope, and this is some distance from the centre, well, case A is extremely obvious. You're obviously looking at two stars. Yeah, I mean, you know, no, nobody would think that you're, you're looking at a single star if you see that, because, in fact, what you're actually seeing is that... Uh, no blackboards <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so... It's quite a, a straightforward idea, is that what you're actually seeing is that you're looking at a very bright spot, yeah, and then another very bright spot. And the fact that the weak side lobes of these two stars slightly overlap with each other doesn't worry you. You definitely say, I'm, look oh, I'm looking at a binary star there, for example. Uh, in modern uh, astronomy, of course, you'd have a very sensitive photon detector which would go ac scan across and you'd measure the number of photons in a, in a very fine line of pixels going across and you would actually measure an intensity which clearly had a dip and then went back up again. So let's make those two sort of pictures match up. Yeah. So clearly you've ang your angular resolution is large enough to separate the objects. But what happens if it's a well, and if it's if it is that you're looking just at a single star, you're going to get basically pattern B, and you're going to so you trace this pattern. Of course, it's making a diffraction pattern, but it's pretty clear when you if you look at case B that your as your photon detector goes across, it picks up the diffraction pattern of that single star and you get a big maximum of intensity in the middle but it's obviously a single star. Now, however, and, 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 and you say, oh yeah, well that was an interesting theory of Bloggs et al, that that was a binary system but it's not, you know, it's a single star. But if you've got two stars that are very close together and you try and resolve them, well, what happens is that you get this composite pattern where when you've got the two stars together, the maximum of one just starts to sit across the minimum of the other. And you get pattern C. And pattern C is now, basically, you've got your two stars like this. It is a binary system. And your photon detector, as you go across, just picks up a little gap if you like, in the middle, because you've got a slight dip in the photon intensity. Now, it's historical to say that uh, when you, because this was, as, you know, people have only recently developed digital techniques and, you know, really accurate photon counters. So, historically, it was reckoned, well, if the first minimum of star one sits exactly on the first max, and remember that, you know, they're both producing their own diffraction patterns. If the, the, the star one's first minimum sits exactly on this maximum, that's what's plotted here in C. You can just see a little dip, yeah? So now you can just say definitely there are two stars there. And so this is called Rayleigh's criterion for the resolution. Case C illustrates this exactly this criterion where the, the diffraction pattern first maximum, and because that is at 1.22 lambda over d, I think I've written this up as a separate view graph somewhere, um, 
you get this so-called Rayleigh's criterion. So the angular resolution of any optical instrument is given by 1.22 lambda over d because that's precisely the condition where the minimum of one diffraction pattern sits on the maximum of an adjacent one. R is in radians, of course lambda is the wavelength in metres, and d is the diameter of the aperture. So um, this is like, if you like, the, the, again, the important point to take away is this calculation here. I should say, if you're a practical astronomer, there's an irony in that we keep this 1.22 lambda over d, but of course with a very accurate photon detector, you can actually tell the difference. There's one diffraction pattern. I'll just sketch you know, the central lobe, the first minimum and the first maximum. Even if this next maximum, <coughs> let's try a different colour, even if the, um, the next maximum is closer than this minimum, so the Rayleigh's criterion would have this maximum here, but even if it was somewhere like here, and the pattern sort of look more like this, your photon detector, because now we've got such incredibly good detectors, you can actually do better. Because that, if you had a single star, you'd have one pattern. And this one, even though it's not got a dip in the middle, it's got a kind of like broadening. And you can tell that this is still from two stars, even when they're closer in than Rayleigh's criterion if you've got a really accurate photon detector. If you're just like looking in a telescope and you want, you know, you're just using your eye, Rayleigh's criterion is correct. So you'll, you'll see a lot of textbooks will say, oh, the angular resolution is given by approximately lambda over d. So the irony is that that 1.22 comes in because of the nature of the Bessel function, but because modern instruments are so good, we can actually get it to belo slightly below lambda over d. But this is still kept as the criterion that is often used. So uh, again, I'll make an, a note on that because this is, you know, if you like, the crucially important point, um, because this is the practical point, the, you know, the limitation of the angular resolution uh, of a telescope. So. Um, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, the airy pattern, or if you will uh, try and find a piece of chalk that's actually longer than my thumbnail here. Oh, here we go. One more. So the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, changing colours in mid-course mid again. The airy pattern is often quoted in relation to the angular resolving power of a telescope. And let me just add here, of course, of course, and similar optical instruments. It, um, you may, for example, be interested in biology, or you may be interested in electron microscopy, and so on, and so on. And this always, because you've got any kind of wave passing through an aperture, is a limitation that is a fundamental limitation that you can't get around. You can't play around with nature so that these waves won't diffract when they go through the aperture. So um, the resolving power is ideally R, try and fit the equation in here, is equal to 1.22 lambda over D. And R is, again, the angular resolution in radians. Lambda is the wavelength of the radiation. So obviously, again, it's completely different if you've got a radio telescope to an optical telescope. You know, it's, a, it's always the comparison in physical optics between the wavelength of the radiation and the diameter of the aperture. Uh, and this is known as Rayleigh's criterion. And again, you know, I can't avoid it. People do confuse things. The Rayleigh distance is the distance where we go from Fraunhofer 
two Fresnel diffraction that we're considering on Friday, the Rayleigh criterion refers purely to the circular patterns in the far field Fraunhofer diffraction. Um, so I, I took an example, oh this is illustrated of course in figure uh, 84 of the course handout. This is why, not sorry not 84, 74. This is, this is why we get the criterion is because of this overlap of the diffraction patterns from adjacent objects. And again, you know, you might be looking in some, you know, cell mitochondria or something with a very high-powered light microscope, and, you know, you might be wondering, you know, are, are the two objects there or is the one? And it's the identical uh, criterion for a microscope as well. So um, I, I've used telescopes as an example, and I'll just continue for, with an example. So for the Hubble telescope... This is obviously the most famous telescope. I think he, he, a lot of the general public have heard of the, the, the Hubble telescope, you know, the space telescope. Uh, you have D is equal to uh, 2.4 metres. The angular resolution for visible light, of course it sees, sees in inverted commas also, in the infrared, in the ultraviolet, and so on. The angular resolution in visible light, and usually if people take lambda equal to about you know, 500 nanometers, take green light somewhere in the middle of the visible spectrum. So we can only say around because visible light covers a range of wavelengths from four to 700 nanometers as we go from the blue to the the red, so it's just approximately 0.05 arc seconds. Now, a trick question, one of which, uh, you know, all, no, 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 it's not a trick question, it, it's, uh, but um, you may think, well, you know, why did we bother with the Hubble telescope to get this high resolution? Because the Keck telescope on Hawaii has got a 10 metre diameter. So it's going, to have, it's going to see deeper into space than the, the so-called Hubble Deep Space Telescope. But this is the limit in factor. There are other factors like scattering in the atmosphere. That's why the Hubble Telescope sees deeper into space. It's got higher angular resolution because the light isn't scattered by the atmosphere. It's outside the Earth's atmosphere. This criterion, this 1.22 lambda over d, is the limit assuming you know, the spherical chickens in a vacuum approximation. You know, the, the, the perfect mirror in a vacuum is limited to this, but on Earth, the Keck telescope, the light has come through kilometres and kilometres. E, you know, e, e, even though, you know, the astronomers do like putting their telescopes in nice places, you know, Tenerife, Hawaii. Oh, no, I've got to go and do a three-week experiment in Hawaii at Christmas. Oh, terrible. You know, they put their telescopes, their excuse, of course, is that, you know, they've got to put them in places where there's very little dust, very little cloud, so there's not much to scatter the light. But m all the terrestrial telescopes are not limited by this ultimate criterion because there's other stuff that fuzzes the image up worse. So it's worth stating that, you know, the, 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 what makes the Hubble telescopes and the image is so, so amazing is the light is pristine. It's not been scattered by dust, it's not been scattered by cloud, and so on. So such high resolution, if you think about practical astronomy, such high resolution is unattainable for a comparable terrestrial telescope. Uh, <coughs> and you can go up a big mountain, you can go to the middle of the Arizona desert with still some dust, with still some cloud, uh, because of random There. We're getting to the end anyway. I'll just try and pin it back on for the last bit. Um, because of uh, random refraction effects in the atmosphere. We'll be doing refraction next week. Um, 
But you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that if you've got dust and water vapour and so on, and the light's passing through it, I mean, a very obvious one, you know the refractive index of water is about one and a third. Uh, obviously, if, the, if you've got water droplets in the atmosphere and the light passes through them, it gets refracted. And those kind of random refraction effect effects off the, off the different um, water droplets give you less good uh, resolution. Okay, so um, that is about... Uh, I should say, too, I'm going to come back to this. Did Phil do with you the Fourier transform of two top hats? Did, did, uh, uh, don't all shout at once. <laughs> because one of the things that I'm going to come back to on Friday, because I think uh, 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 a lot of people get again confused with this, is that when you do young slits two slit interference, you start off by assuming the slits are infinitesimal and just acting as secondary as sources of secondary waves. And if you like, that's precisely what we did when we did two slit interference. If you think about it, well, the way we did two slit interference was we just got two sources and we went far enough away that we used the plane wave approximation. But of course, a real Young's double slit experiment, each slit has got a finite width and each slit produces its own diffraction pattern. And in that case, of course, you have to take the Fourier transform of a double top hat function. But there's, you know, there's no extra difficulty uh, involved in it. Um, uh, however, I should give a heads up, it's, it's the red cagoule, red trousers, red everything. Friday, we're going to have a crack at Fresnel diffraction. Now, again, don't panic. You're not expected to be able to calculate Fresnel diffraction. And when you, if you come to Friday's lecture, you'll see why. <laughs> <coughs>